tuned into Quick Charge, the high voltage podcast bringing you the top stories in electric vehicles and sustainable energy daily. And it's all powered by electric. Welcome back to Quick Charge. It's June 10th, 2024. I'm your host, Joe Boris. Today's episode, we're going to start off with news about Tesla's shareholder vote. Now, among other things being voted on by Tesla shareholders is Elon Musk's $56 billion compensation package. Depending on who you believe, this is something that is critical towards Tesla's well-being and continued growth and leadership as an AI and self-driving robo-taxi type company. Or some would argue that it's Elon holding the company ransom, otherwise he's going to take all of its resources and spend it on his own privately held company, X or XAI, depending on what he's calling it this week. So I will refrain from commentary on that, but I will point out that Zero Hedge on Twitter, sorry, X, don't like the dead name things, especially during Pride Month, Norway's $1.7 trillion sovereign wealth fund has voted against or will be voting against the $56 billion pay package for Tesla. Elon immediately responded saying, yeah, this is not cool. If they actually surveyed their constituents, they would discover overwhelming support in favor. So far, roughly 90% of retail shareholders who have voted have voted in favor of both resolutions. The public sentiment is unequivocally supportive. A couple of caveats there. The first one being that a fund's job is to make money, not necessarily do what its people want. And if the fund doesn't think that voting in favor of Musk's compensation package is going to make the money, they have a fiduciary responsibility to not do so. Now, the other caveats in there, Fred really does a great job pointing this out. So obviously, Fred Lambert, who's our Tesla expert, has been covering Tesla since the very beginning. He knows the ins and outs of this stuff. And he has also put in a number of referrals. So he's obviously been a very strong Tesla and Musk supporter in the past. But he does point out two really important caveats to Musk's statement. 90% of retail shareholders doesn't mean 90% of the shares held by shareholders. Retail shareholders also represent less than half of Tesla's outstanding shares. Institutional investors represent the majority. But that's not the really key thing here. The key thing is this next paragraph that says, this was actually a problem with the recent Disney proxy battle. Some investors called for Disney to be investigated by the SEC after vote results were leaked to the media prior to the vote being closed. This was seen as a PR tactic by Disney, since only the company and its advisors could have had access to the results for them to be leaked to the media. So the comment here is effectively that this could be an SEC violation. This could be seen as an attempt to sway the vote, influence the vote, or in some other way, manipulate the stock price. This is something that's really critical here, and we need to be careful about how it's reported. And obviously, Elon, I think, needs to be careful in what he says and confirms about these different votes. In other Tesla news, Fred finally got his hands on a Cybertruck. Fred put out an incredibly good video, I think very much worth watching on YouTube. His full review of the Cybertruck as someone who's driven and has intimately familiar with all of Tesla's products. I think Fred is a great resource for someone who's really trying to get a sense of what the Cybertruck is like. But I think Fred's review was overall very positive of the truck. I think it's worth highlighting this one paragraph from his review. I am particularly impressed by the technology inside the Cybertruck. It drives amazingly well. I was particularly impressed by the drive-by wire system, which makes the truck drive like a video game. The rear steering makes it turn on a dime. Also, Tesla should be commended for being the first to push to move to a 48-volt architecture. Now, again, Fred's review, I think, is beyond criticism. He did a great job going through all the features, talking about how it rides and drives, I do want to take issue a little bit with that 48 volt architecture. I've seen that several times mentioned with this vehicle, especially among some of the more ardent Tesla supporters talking about how this is the first time 48 volt has been used in the architecture of vehicle. I'm not sure that's entirely true. I was looking around. This is from 2016. The Bentley Bentayaga is the first mass market vehicle, if you can call a Bentley mass market, to come to market with a 48 volt application. That was its dynamic ride and active suspension system. Going a little further, 2019, 2020, even 2021, you start to see like the BMW i8 and i3 using 48 volt systems. Chevy's Blazer Hybrid in China says it's a 48 volt system. A lot of mild hybrids and other electrified vehicles have been using. 48 volt systems throughout a large component of their architecture. They still use 12 volt systems effectively to power the accessories and the OBD2, which 
Tesla still does in a way. They still have their accessory system and they're still powering. They're using some different technology to meet that OBD2 guideline. This is one of those cases where technology is moving much more quickly than legislation. Obviously, in the US, you have to have that OBD2 port, which is 12 volt powered in order to read out codes. It's part of a number of laws in this country regarding right to repair. And we're not going to get into that today, but these are terms that we should all know, terms that we should all understand. And I think it's uh, worth noting that while the Cybertruck may be the first vehicle to exclusively use 48 volt electronics throughout its architecture, it's certainly not the first application of 48 volt technology. That happened about seven or eight years ago. Moving on beyond the world of Tesla, Hyundai and Tesla, of course, paved the way for long-range 300-plus mile EVs as prices fall below average gas cars. This is great news for anybody who's been following the EV revolution since the early days, back when the Tesla Roadster was still something that was being written about, right? There has always been this idea that price parity would mean that EVs would effectively cost less than their gas-powered counterparts. Now, in the U.S., the last couple of years, we have seen the average transaction price of a new vehicle go beyond forty-six, forty-seven, nearly forty-eight thousand dollars. Now, this is everything. This is all average in there. This is SUVs. This is pickup trucks. This is you know Bugattis and Mitsubishi's. This is the full range, the full gamut, right? So that's where they get that average transaction price from. Well, we've started to see not only vehicles coming in much lower than the average transaction price and still delivering decent usable range and decent usable fast charging. But now with this latest generation of Kia's EV6s and Hyundai's Ionics and things like that, and especially, you know, full credit to Tesla, they've been doing a fantastic job leading the charge for these affordable long range vehicles. We are now seeing that there are several 300 mile options with extremely fast charging that are coming in well below that average transaction price. So that's good news. And I think that means we're going to see a lot faster adoption. That hockey stick is really going to start picking up now. And an even more affordable note, the Nissan Leaf, the previous generation Chevy Bolt and Bolt EUV, these are vehicles that for the last couple of years, you've been able to get for that twenty dollars to $25,000 price when you factor in all the incentives that have been out there. So this is something that's been a much more affordable option than even the average transaction price internal combustion vehicle. For about half the average transaction price, you've been able to get a Nissan Leaf or a Chevy Bolt, both modern EVs. Now, Nissan is offering Chevy Bolt drivers a deal. They're going to get an additional discount, additional $1,000 if they trade in a Chevy Bolt on a Leaf. Now, this is not a product endorsement type of show. Nissan builds a tremendous product. The Leaf certainly has its place. You're a local driver. You're not taking it on road trips, things like that. And the reason I say that I would hesitate or that I wouldn't necessarily recommend this to anybody that I know is because the Leaf uses the Chatamo charging system. Now, if you look over my shoulder here, this is the one on the far right. This is a very widely used charging standard throughout Japan, but it is not something that's widely used in North America. The Nissan Leaf, the early Mitsubishi IMEV, the original Kia Soul EV, some of those used the Chatamo system, but for the most part, it's kind of fallen by the wayside. And I think right now, and feel free to jump in the comments and correct me on this, the Leaf is the only vehicle that's currently using the Chatamo charging standard. And there are very, very few out there. It's actually not even part of the Nevi standard. So you will not be seeing these charging stations popping up along highways in the next few years. So it's really interesting to see who is going to end up taking them up on this. And I think, you know, it, it's going to be one of those things where if this is your first time buying an EV or if you've been reading all these articles about how exciting the new Hyundais are, how exciting the new Teslas are, how exciting the new Rivians are and how great they are. And you can take them all the way across the country and not even worry about it. And then you decide it's time to buy your first EV and you go buy a Nissan Leaf. I think you're going to have some trouble if you don't understand exactly what you're getting into. So this infographic up here is provided by our friends at Flow. They put this together and I've used it many times throughout my articles. You know, you're the reader of Electrek. You know the difference between CCS, North American Charging Standard, or the Tesla Standard, and uh, the Chatamo. Be sure that anyone you know in your life who's looking to buy one of these, make sure they understand what they're getting into. If this is something that's going to fit their lifestyle, the Nissan Leaf is a tremendous vehicle, 225 miles of range, decent acceleration, super zippy around town, great product, can't say enough positive things about it, but it's not going to give the same 
type of over the road, long haul driving experience and ownership experience, frankly, that you're going to get out of a Tesla or even a Chevy Bolt. So make sure you keep that in mind if anybody asks you about this deal. Moving on, Volvo suddenly shifted its EX30 and EX90 production to Belgium to avoid Chinese-made EV tariffs. Now, this is really important. There's a number of governments throughout the world, not only in the U.S. and North America, but in the EU as well, who are putting high tariffs on made-in-China vehicles, Chinese vehicles. Now, Volvo, being owned by a Chinese company, is navigating these waters, I think, very well. We've seen last week, we saw EX90 production begin in South Carolina. We're seeing now that this EX30 and EX90 production is being moved to Europe. That's exactly what these tariffs are meant to do. They're protectionist policies put out by governments to ensure that jobs, labor, things like that stay domestic rather than get shipped out or farmed out overseas because that's what companies do. Corporations go after the least expensive labor market to manufacture the goods so that they can be sold in the markets at the highest profit margins. This is not a criticism on capitalism. It's just an explanation of how it works. And these kind of policies, protectionist policies throughout the world, tariffs exist to protect the employment and labor of the people in those countries. So this kind of just means that the legislation is doing its job. Whether you agree with it or not is a different issue. It's meant to be protectionist. It's meant to keep production local and domestic. And that's exactly what it's doing in this case. So expect to see more news about EX30 production in as far as North America goes in the next couple of weeks. EX90 is already being produced in South Carolina. So if you're a fan of uh, these kind of tariffs, this is all great stuff. If you're not, then uh, you know start using this as evidence to write to your Congress people. Now, finally, we're going to do something a little more fun. This is Scooter Doll. He was in South Florida last week, and he got to ride on one of Flight's new e-foils. This is effectively an electric hydrofoil surfboard kind of thing. Gives you a sensation of flying above the water. I love these. I got a chance to ride some of these back in 2021 and 2022 when I was doing Electrify Expo in Miami. These are really cool, and this was Scooter's first chance on them. And he actually captured the experience of riding one of these flight boards, I think, in a really poetic really uh, literary sort of way. So I want to read it to you just to give you a sense of it. After a couple of runs, I learned just how subtle your leans forward and backward have to be on the e-foil to fly. The sensation of floating above the water cannot be overemphasized. It's truly a feeling of weightlessness and joy, and the lack of noise from the electric motor allows you to take in the moment cutting through the water until you get too cocky, wobble, and get humbly ejected. I don't know about that last part, um, I definitely experienced getting ejected, but I'm not going to talk about that in a public forum. That's ridiculous. That's it for Quick Charge on June 10th. Be sure to hit like and subscribe if you liked what you heard. If you don't like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you can come back to the comments over and over again and tell me how little I know about everything.